Thank you, Sarah. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jason Kelly Johnson. I'm an associate professor in the architecture division at CCA in San Francisco and the co-director of the Digital Craft Lab. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for this lecture by Carrie Norman and Thomas Kelly, um, the third event of our fall um, architecture lecture series. Um, if you'd like, you can enable closed captioning at the bottom of your Zoom window right now. Um, I think it's just called live transcript. It's a button that you'll have to just press manually on your own. So if you want that, go ahead and do that. Um, at CCA, we understand land acknowledgement as a transformative act meant to confront our place on native lands and to build mindfulness of our present participation and colonial legacies. California College of the Arts um, campuses are located on Huchin and Yelamu and also um, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively, on the unceded territories of the Cho Chen Yo and the Ra Mai Tush Olon peoples, who have continuously lived upon this land since the time immemorial. So we recognize this historic um, discrimination and violence inflicted upon the indigenous peoples of California and the Americas, including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. CCA honors indigenous peoples, past, present, and future here and around the world. And we wish to pay respect to local elders, including those of the lands from which you are joining us virtually today. Before I introduce our speakers, um, I'd also like to tell you about the next event in our series, um, which is a lecture on October 20th, also Wednesday at 5 p.m. Um, we'll be joined by Jennifer Newsom and Thomas Carruthers, who'll present the work um, of their office called Dream the Combine. Um, you can also find the full spring lecture um, schedule along with stories um, by and about our students, faculty and alumni at scaffold.architecture.cca.edu. Sarah has just posted the link um, to the chat function um, in Zoom, which I encourage you to follow along and, and potentially post questions to as the lecture proceeds. Um, now I'd like to introduce you to our speakers, um, Carrie Norman and Thomas Kelly. I've personally known Carrie and, and Thomas for, I guess it's 15 plus years now. Um, first as students, um, then collaborators, um, where they were among our very first employees here at Future Forms, um, working out of a 20 foot by 20 foot windowless studio space in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, they were and remain two of the most thoughtful, smart, hardworking, um, and I would say mischievous, um, but also fun collaborators that Natalie and I have ever worked with to date. Um, and of course, now they are accomplished teachers, architects, intellectuals, and I understand parents. I think they both have multiple kids or multiple kids on the way. Um, so busy people um, and amazing people, and it's just such a, privilege to um, introduce them tonight. Carrie and Thomas um, founded um, Norman Kelly in 2012. The practice is based both in New Orleans and Chicago. Um, they've done a lot in um, you know, less than 10 years, and I'm not going to list everything that they've accomplished. Um, they have been involved with the, with the 14th um, Venice Biennale, Architecture Biennale, the Chicago Architecture Biennale in 2015. They also won the Architecture League um, New York Young Architects Prize in 2014, amongst you know, other ac amazing accomplishments. Um, Carrie Norman was born in Los Angeles in 1984. She re received her MARC um, from Princeton and her BARC from the University of Virginia. Um, she's also a licensed architect and an assistant professor at Tulane um, University School of Architecture in New Orleans. Thomas Kelly was born in Australia in 1984. Um, he received, received his MARC from Princeton, his BARC from the um, University of Virginia. He was also the recipient of the Rainer, um, uh, uh, Peter Rayner Bannum Fellowship from um, SUNY Buffalo, and he recently won the Rome Prize in Architecture from the American Academy in Rome. And he's currently an assistant professor at the University of Illinois um, at Chicago School of Architecture. So we're really privileged to have these two um, extraordinary um, people um, 
sharing their work um, with us tonight. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming them to CCA. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jason, for the uh, generous introduction. Um, it's so nice to see your face and, and everyone else's, and especially uh, Natalie Gatenio, uh, who is someone else we would claim as a, as a mentor. Uh, we'd also like to thank Keith Crumwitty uh, for the invitation. We're sad he's not here, but whenever he watches this video later, hi, Keith. So we'll go ahead and jump in. Um, our partnership began with two individuals operating as one. This often confused our earliest of collaborators, and we'd frequently receive inquiries addressed to Norman, uh, the individual. Our intention was never to confuse anyone, but when it happened, it never bothered us. Uh, for us, authorship is never singular. Now and always, uh, our partnership is concerned with questions of double identity or split personality. Uh, we find pleasure in the lasting mediations invoked by two things becoming one, one thing becoming two. Presented with competing identities, we think viewers are enlisted as participants, deciding for themselves how best to entangle ambiguities. So like a sibling with a twin, sometimes our work appears like a double or a copy or a split personality or an impersonation uh, of something already present in the world. In our work, drawings are site specific, objects are altered and rooms are reused. The common thread here is an affinity for architecture to succeed something found. Generally, a project begins with observation and ends in alteration. So kind of put another way, this is a, a process of vision and revision. Uh, more broadly, our work re-examines architecture's relationship to perception through deceptive optics. So to break that down even further, let's start with this image. Uh, so we're gonna look a little closer. This is an icon or trick of the eye in the form of a wooden decoy used by duck hunters to make their prey feel more comfortable. The term is used to refer to a North American hunting tradition of crafting wooden bird decoys and uh, dates back to the 19th century. These icons or confidence decoys as they were sometimes called were not replicas of the species being hunted. There were those two, but rather replicas of other species placed among those decoys. So as to float a familiar scene. Here, a fake mallard is used to lure a real heron. Like the wooden duck decoy, our work in many cases depends on the firmness of legibility to operate. What do we mean by that? Well, it means that generally the work is not visually abstract, but rather it relies on familiarity to construct and reconstruct visual relationships between its observers and that which he or she observes. So for instance, if you look closely enough, uh, a circle is also a sphere, maybe even a window. In the past, we've likened uh, this intent uh, to something approximating magic. And in a way, uh, we'd, we'd ask, isn't an architect also a magician? Um, isn't she someone who alters the familiar? We consider this outlook an earnest one. Uh, the architect is a mediator between two and three dimensions. So far, this has been primarily a visual experiment, uh, but we're working on expanding our senses. Thank you for your attention tonight, and we invite you to sit back, slow your gaze, and look patiently as we discuss our work's double lives. So uh, this includes drawings, objects, and, and rooms. Uh, the, the first are drawings, uh, defined as a one-to-one -one set of superficial marks drawn using graphite, ink, vinyl, or paint. In most instances, the drawings are site-specific, temporary, and corrective. Though the style of projection is highly abstracted, their content is highly literal. The second are objects in our studies in transposition. Like impersonations, our objects are furniture-like doubles who cause style, type, and function to change places with each other. And the third, rooms. A room is a closed interior, often accessed through no more than two existing doors. Surgical in appearance, our rooms grow from the surfaces of an existing room. Like a Greg Schneider room, our rooms are designed to speculate on altered readings of existing form, function, and meaning. And so with that, let's dive a little deeper into drawings. 
A drawing tends to begin with someone else's drawing, or at least someone else's definition of a drawing. The drawings shown here are scaled reproductions of a one-to-one -one mark embossed or painted upon an actual architectural surface, be it a wall or a floor or the ground. In all but one of these examples, the drawing is performed on the architecture by the architect. The black sheep is at the top left, the artist Blinky Palermo's black right angle. In this case, the drawing was meant to correct or maybe embarrass an existing shortcoming in proportion and was originally exhibited alongside Gerhard Richter's toilet drawing, or painting rather. A uh, drawing can also be transposed from one picture plane to another to add new meaning. Here, da Vinci's study on the proportions of head and eyes gets transposed by hand onto the face of a toddler-sized mannequin, sort of an ex exercise in spherical projection. So the first time we drew on a building was actually in Rome uh, in 2014. Um, the site was a 1913 McKim Mead and White uh, Palazzo, home to the American Academy in Rome. Um, I think it was in this exact position as pictured on the right where um, uh, <laughs> Carrie uh, spent most of her time in Rome. Um, it was kind of a uh, anti-sightseeing visit, if you will. Um, but if you've ever visited the actual building, you'll uh, recall a strange hallway on its second floor. This is what we're looking at right now. Um, and on one side of the hallway, we have eight doors that lead to eight scholars' offices with windows facing an interior courtyard. On the other side is a blank wall measuring approximately 100 feet long and 12 feet high. The corridor measures only 32 inches wide. Um, and if you could look through the blank wall on your right here in the left image, uh, you would be looking down into the main reading room of the two-story Arthur and Janet <clears throat> C. Ross Library. Uh, also home to a rare book section designed by Michael Graves. So here we have a section of the building and although they appear disconnected, the hallway and the library are adjacent uh, both in plan and section, as is the case with certain mannerist buildings or in this case, uh, a mannerist copy. Uh, the front fa facade of the building is of primary importance and will often yield residual aberrations. Um, so the corridor was clearly an afterthought. And so using uh, graphite transfer paper and some ink highlights, uh, the corridor is superficially transformed. Um, five archways are drawn, uh, a building aberration is corrected and a view is liberated. The corridor and the library get connected by way of an anamorphic projection or distorted view that can only be experienced by a singular vantage point. And with the aid of attenuating line work um, done by hand, uh, a viewer looks down into the library one story below. Uh, and like a blinky Palermo wall painting, the fix is superficial and uh, eventually painted over, returning the wall to its mistake. The first time we drew on a building in New York, we acted like brats for the Architectural League of New York's Young Architects Exhibition in 2014. We depicted the largest trapezoidal window of the now Met Royer building. The window itself was drawn to scale, but more importantly, we drew the facing buildings one would see looking out from the window at the side of Madison Avenue. At the time, I suppose we were a little frustrated to not get a window location in the gallery. So uh, we drew one instead. Uh, when we drew on a building in Chicago, uh, we used drawing to consider the scale of the neighborhood. So in this case, our context was the uh, community of Pilsen, um, the southern uh, side of Chicago. Uh, we toured the neighborhood and took careful note of its ad hoc brick patterns. And in collaboration with the Chicago Art Department, uh, we created a uh, storefront um, clad with plywood. It became the canvas for a taxonomy of over 30 different brick patterns from the neighborhood. The patterns were uh, bonded, dimensioned, and painted a color to match the building's neighbor. And our hope was that the assemblage reminded the community of its layered history. And uh, another time we drew in Chicago completely changed our way of thinking about drawing. Here we saw a drawing and its scope match that of any building project we'd uh, taken on. In 2015, the Chicago Architecture Biennial tasked us with cladding the 65 Michigan Avenue uh, facing windows of the Chicago Cultural Center. The challenge was really twofold. For one, the drawing needed to function like a sign 
and steal attention from Anish Kapoor's bean sculpture, which is across the street, um, as well as invigorate the lesser known of Chicago's two Shepley, Rutan, and Coolidge Beaux Arts buildings. Um, the one that most people uh, generally know is the Art Institute. Uh, the second charge was to respond to Stanley Tigerman's 1977 prompt, The State of the Art of Architecture. So here we thought it best to try our uh, hat at practicing populism. So we began by looking at the way Chicagoans looked out and onto their city. Uh, more specifically, we began by looking closely at Chicago's architectural history through its fenestration styles. So for example, our Chicago office um, is located in the Monadnock building. Um, and through our 19th century masonry wall, we face uh, Harry Weese's prison um, in, in the middle photo. Um, or we find this interesting. Did you know um, in the Hancock uh, building, people actually pay a premium um, to have their view obstructed by uh, the X bracing uh, that you'll see in the right image. And, and though we began with, with actual references and actual projects, the taxonomy grew into a system of really normalizing Chicago's history of looking in and out of its buildings. The aim was to provide uh, a revised history of Chicago's architectural styles that included forgotten heroes like Keck and Keck or the Burnham brothers, uh, as well as a reminder of passer, passersby of how curtains or blinds are equally as important to elevating or disguising a view as our actual mullions or, or sash hardware. But perhaps most akin to a building with a budget and a client, our taxonomy was, was loose in terms of composition and coverage. The vinyl only accounted for 50% coverage of the full window site, um, which allowed the curators as well as the building's um, standard office occupants uh, to rearrange the, our positioning of the vinyl decals as they saw appropriate for, for allowing light into the interior exhibitions um, and their, their working spaces. Um, this is uh, on the left, uh, one of our, our favorite photographs um, of the project. Um, one of the, the most photographed uh, moments of the whole uh, biennial was um, the MIT and, and ETH's rock print. Um, but here you can see our Palladian uh, style window sort of photo bombing it uh, with its shadow. Sometimes the drawings are neither corrective or entirely two dimensional. So in the spring of 2018, we were invited by the curator Irene Sun Wu um, to design the exhibition for a show on these two characters seen here, the artist and architect Shusaku Arakawa seen on the right and his collaborator and wife, the poet and philosopher Madeline Ginz. The exhibition titled Arakawa and Madeline Ginn's Eternal Gradient held at the Arthur Ross Architecture Gallery at Columbia University and then later at the Graham Foundation in Chicago uh, featured over 40 original drawings by the artist architect duo. Complications in the curation though uh, emerged as a result of legal disputes between two foundations, each of which claimed ownership uh, of Arakawa and Ginn's body of work. In the late stages of the curation process, uh, many drawings initially selected for the exhibition were prohibited due to the ongoing legal battles of ownership, uh, including this sketch from one of Arakawa and Ginz's most significant projects, The Mechanism of Meaning. In any case, the project, including the drawing picture here, uh, were forbidden from the show. Uh, to include it required an act of what we like to call smuggling. While the practice of forgery is often in service of deception and its product invalidating, our role as the exhibition's designer recast it as an act of recovery. The result is on one hand, a drawing approximating Arakawa's original sketch, and on the other, a series of objects with a display of framed works and archival ephemera or drawings inside of a drawing. This project doesn't fit quite neatly within the category of drawings, but falls somewhere between drawing and our next medium objects. From this view, the boundary between two and three dimensions or vinyl and steel is most clear. Like our other drawings fleeting fate, perceiving Arakawa's reconstructed sketch is only temporarily perceived. If you're too fast, you might miss it. And as the viewer moves through the exhibition, the steel structures privilege other modes of seeing. Like drawings, our objects often begin with something already present in the world. 
and may be understood as alterations to existing forms. Our objects not only look like furniture, but perhaps furniture you may already know, a Windsor chair, a Chippendale table, or a shaker stool, for example. When it comes to objects, uh, we typically design them as if they were constrained by a singular projection, like an elevation or a plan. Oblique combinations of either of these projections tend to offer a more economical description of the object. In this case, we wanted to design a table whose presupposed movement, in this case, a drop leaf, uh, but replaced its movable qualities with the form that offered an economical posture. So we fixed the standard drop leaf table and sheared it by 20 degrees. You'll notice both the front and back elevations offer identical and simultaneous viewing of the short and long faces. And here the table as it was presented during the Spaces Without Drama exhibition curated by LIGA, Space for Architecture, at the Graham Foundation in the spring of 2017. The show's prompt involved tracing similarities between theatrical stage sets and architectural scale models. In our case, the table's horizontal surface served as the ground for restaging itself amidst its immediate context. So the resultant prop adheres to its life-size counterpart in resolution only. Its tectonic, however, is reduced to a two-dimensional cutout, bringing into focus the exhibition's subtitle Surface is an illusion, but so is depth. The next set of objects titled Wrong Chairs were our first foray into furniture design. I'd remind you that we are not furniture designers, never claim to be, but rather furniture appropriators. We believe that architects have designed enough chairs. So we return to a familiar type, the American Windsor, and look at it through a new lens of intentional mistake making. We discovered the cut sheets of Dr. John Cassay on how to make American Windsor furniture and we began to study them carefully. The Windsor type is incredibly simple in its tectonics. Back and legs plug into a raised ground or seat. So we confuse its restaging by reading the cut sheets elevations literally. In the case of the settee, we intentionally collapse the half front elevation typically used to indicate mirrored symmetry and side elevation as a complete front elevation. Confusing I know. On the left, Dr. John Cassay's original drawings, and on the right, our redrawn elevation. The result is a bit more simple. That's simply a chair that compresses its two seated occupants, putting them a little bit closer than they might like to be. The strategy of deploying tectonic and superficial air in nuanced ways would play out six more times in slightly different ways. And here's the complete set of unaltered elevations. And here, the complete set of altered elevations. Uh, the completed pieces were made in collaboration with our good friend Reeves Rash at his studio in Kentucky, and third, uh, and also along with third generation wood turners uh, across the border in uh, in Ohio. The collection was originally designed as a dining set, um, and uh, the chairs were. Uh, following that kind of initial exhibition as a dining set were then exhibited in Chicago at Volume Gallery as individuals uh, within a two-dimensional white wall gallery. And so here are a few of our, our favorites and some of their kind of finer traits, uh, a side chair with the confused mirrored symmetry. Here a high chair with rotated leg bracing to provide a ladder to its back with an omitted uh, uh, rail. And here an end chair um, with one of the least noticeable transpositions of shifted leg support. And here where visual surprises yield a tactile one uh, when seated on the stool an approximated curve lends its user clarity between left and right. But here I remind you that in all cases the chairs return to function like chairs when a body activated them. Speaking of the body, um, perhaps some of you have, have practiced ballet. Uh, if so, then you'll- My daughter know. just started that chair, actually. Oh, congrats. That's so cute. Um, you know, if, you, if you're familiar, uh, you'll know that to practice ballet, your body needs to be proportioned like this body, uh, no taller than five foot six, unfortunately. This was part of the research conducted during our collaboration with the dancer, choreographer, and artist, Brendan Fernandez. Now he was interested in designing objects or devices for uh, what's called durational performances, 
Um, so in short, a ballet dancer would be required to hold a canonical position, such as arabesque second position, uh, for an uninterrupted interval of 10 minutes or so uh, before being allowed to walk or stretch. So uh, we designed a custom scale figure to manipulate into the exact positions Brendan required. Like a Neufert diagram, uh, our collaboration demanded drawing the ballet dancers' positions with precise specifications. Um, and it would, it would eventually include a, a set of custom designed scale figures, such as the one pictured on the left, to pressure uh, his dancers into idealized positions. On the right, a dancer holding in arabesque pose. Um, and you'll notice where each project makes contact with the body, her heel in this case, the object is wrapped in leather. And here, a dancer holding in camber on the ground, uh, the pose for approximately 10 minutes during the 2019 Whitney uh, Biennial. So in total, five objects were designed for five uh, specific poses. So for the design of our collection titled Young Americans, uh, we read you George Washington's Mount Vernon study. Um, uh, uh, revisit to our Virginia roots. Um, the original study pictured here uh, houses one of the most eclectic and strange collections of 18th and 19th century furniture. I'll add that neither of us have visited the space, um, but upon observing this setting from Mount Vernon's uh, web-based virtual tour, we understood the scene as an accumulation of inconsistent styles and intents. In other words, a group show. Here, our altered drawing includes two of our own insertions, a fixed tilt top mirror table uh, in the middle corner and a roll top armchair in the lower right. The piece's second group show would prove as diverse and strange a setting as their first. Uh, pieces were presented at Friedman Benda Gallery in New York in 2018, alongside some good friends like Moss, Millions, um, and So Ill, um, for an exhibition on aporetic furniture curated by Juan Garcia Mosquera. In the foreground, a table designed by Moss and in between a room divider designed by the Brooklyn-based design studio, uh, Andy and Dave, uh, you can see our tilt top mirror table. In isolation, the pieces question and advance social narratives that once attended the object's original dimensions and proportions. The original tilt top area, uh, tea table, more than the teapot or the teacup that rested on its surface, was the object by which the ritual of tea drinking gained its recognition and acceptance. The quote unquote brash honesty, or let's call it gossip, that characterized tea table discussions constituted a sort of circumspection that effectively policed the actions of the powerful and elite by threatening to expose scandal and subject any wrongdoers to ridicule. Our revision extends the watchful eye of the tilt top tea table by lengthening the pedestal to elevate the vertically oriented tabletop. At this height, upon close range, the observer is offered her reflection in the mirrored finish of its convex surface. The roll top armchair finds its origins around the same time, just following the American Revolution. Although the fondness for English styles had faded, this style's labeling, it, labeling itself federal found itself enthusiastically embraced by Americans. Among the federal style's notable forms were secretaries and writing desks. And within this variety, flexible timbre and roll top screens were new technologies and could quickly conceal an unkept workspace. Our revision narrows the roll top desk to the width of a chair and substitutes a stack of drawers and shelves with perimeter lined upholstered cushions. So much simpler in construction is our more recent collection of two by four furniture that we contributed to uh, the, the recent American Framing Pavilion at this year's Venice Biennale. We were tasked with creating furniture from leftover material used to construct the American pavilions installation. Uh, so our pieces uh, became a zero waste effort in creating furniture entirely out of parts cut from standard two by four wooden studs. Um, silent how-to films accompany basic assembly drawings like these to be constructed by carpenters on site. So taken together, our goal was to produce a set of instructions that would allow anyone independent of skill level to make their own furniture. And the results neatly blend into their context, uh, framed by the same material used to construct them. The one exception is in their variegated staining. The two by fours were stained prior to being ripped or cut, 
so the contrast between the outer stained edges and the lighter unstained interior uh, produces a mysterious puzzle of the two by fours pattern of cuts. Similarly simple in its construction, but no less impactful uh, of a history is this chair. Um, one of our favorite elements from the two projects we contributed to make new history, the 2017 Chicago Architecture Biennial. Um, as part of a collaboration with Sylvia Lavin, Aaron Besler, and Jessica Colangelo, we were tasked with reimagining, reenacting, and restaging a photograph. Re was a big part of not just our show, but the whole show. Uh, the photograph originally taken in 1984 on your left uh, was used to advertise the opening of O.M. Unger's recently completed German Architecture Museum, or the DAM. Uh, in the image, you see a curator seated upon a chair overlooking a collection of postmodern models. Uh, some of the models were fake models, some were authentic. Uh, the exhibition on your right consisted of a room made entirely out of foam, models made entirely out of paper, and that chair made entirely out of wood. The chair was noticeably uncomfortable, but key in positioning our curator, Sylvia, in a similar way to that of the original curator. The mise-en-scene would have been incomplete without an object that belonged to Owen Munger's original lecture hall, and if scaled and finished appropriately, an object has the potential to carry with it all the implications of the room to which it originally belongs. Uh, this invisible transference is what makes the object capable of being overlooked, so overlooked that we think the exhibition manager may have even tossed the chairs after the exhibition closed. So if thought of through their temporal means, where drawings last the length of an exhibition and objects move around, then rooms are the closest thing to permanent we have designed thus far. Like drawings and objects, rooms we design also begin with something already present in the world and may be understood as alterations to existing structures. One of our recently completed rooms was informed by an object, um, this object to be precise. You're looking at a wall shelf with chrome plated tubular steel supports and wooden shelves. If you look closely at the shelves, you'll see that they're not fixed to the front tube. Instead, they cantilever off of the back tube, sort of a minor illusion, but nonetheless significant. The detail was originally designed by Mies van der Rohe at a larger scale for a 1930 commission for Philip Johnson's New York apartment. However, the first production of this shelf in the freestanding version shown here was actually in 1937, designed for the architect's daughter's house in Rattenau, a small town near Berlin. Uh, the type would manifest itself in a variety of forms, sometimes clad in a reflective finish, like at the Tugendhat house. The object would become a point of departure for relaxing a series of domestic Miesian details within the thousand square foot uh, of Aesop's Lincoln Park store. The concept we presented to the client uh, was the single collage pictured here. In the image, you can glimpse Stanley Tigerman's Titanic or sinking of Crown Hall in Lake Michigan with a foregrounded Mies who looks uh, unfazed. At any rate, our design negotiates its existing conditions through a rotational symmetry observed from the entrance. Upon entering, you see the Miesian shelves presented to you as it may have been in Philip Johnson's apartment. The existing interior consisted of a strange relationship with its basement and an adjacent alleyway. So our correction would wedge the circulation down to the basement into a gap of flooring barely 36 inches wide ahead of an existing window wall facing a tree in, in the back alley. The new configuration would connect two spaces with the 36 inch elevation change by way of a tiny L staircase. It would also create an invisible vestibule between the main sales floor and its shared hallway to avoid visibility of a prominent exit sign. The main room was eventually curated around three primary elevations of rift sawn walnut veneer panels. Images like this, a photographic elevational survey, were constructed after photographing and cataloging each panel. Together with the client, the position of each panel was studied to provide as even a distribution of texture, direction, and tone. So sort of by comparison, our goal was to make Mises' affinity for control as seen in his use of book matched wood and stone patterns uh, look relaxed in comparison to, to our level of control. And the final photographs of the Eastern walls. 
here the south wall. And the final photograph of the south wall. And uh, the west wall's elevational survey. And a final photograph of the west wall. I think much of our obsession over drawings uh, comes from an obsession with Agnes Martin. Um, if you had a chance to see a retrospective at the Guggenheim uh, many years ago now, you'd have been hit with two realizations. Uh, one, the work is beautiful, and two, the work is incredibly boring. Uh, the second observation is most important to the design of this next room. Uh, this is our first collaboration with, with ESOP. Uh, we focus our attention on the irregularity of one very specific material unit, um, or the buff tone Chicago common brick. This brick is approximately three and a half inches wide and eight inches long, uh, with a dimensional tolerance that wavers as much as about half an inch. Now that may not mean much to, to uh, uh, us, but to a, a mason, uh, that's a pretty big tolerance. Um, and it yields numerous difficulties for producing controlled patterns. Like Martin's irregular grids, uh, we sought to take this material, uh, usually found on non-street facing exterior walls and, and fairly ubiquitous just around Chicago in general, uh, since the fire of 1871, um, we use it as our dominant finish. And to make matters more challenging, we use three different types of Chicago common brick, uh, a full brick, uh, a paver brick, and a queen brick, um, which is the remaining mass left over after you cut two pavers from a full brick. The different types allowed us to control the bricks pattern in horizontal and vertical orientations, as well as to balance the existing interiors awkward proportions with a lowered floor and a new heating and cooling system. Here you have the existing plan of the space, three round rooms characterized uh, it, uh, punctuated with what be would become a very stubborn column uh, just off center halfway through the space. Um, our alterations involved removing the column once a chimney flew for an upstairs apartment that remained um, and focusing our attention uh, to the perimeter where shelving would fill deepened wall cavities. The narrow recesses between shelving projections would also negotiate the new heating and cooling system while pressuring the interior with more mass. Uh, these are some of the drawings we made early on in the project to reveal a working method through drawing. Um, so like a coloring book the neutrality of the black and white line drawn perspective uh, lent itself to easy back and forth conversations with the client as to how to fill them in. Each primary direction was studied with this method and here looking from the point of sale toward the storefront. Here looking at the south wall. Here at the north wall. The drawings also reveal a little bit um, of our kind of overzealousness with, with texture. Um, we should add, this is one of our first projects of this scale, and we hadn't really honed the practice of restraint quite yet. The updated versions reflect that greater restraint and control. Um, that said, we're still sad that back wall uh, isn't clad in brick. It's kind of a fight we couldn't win. Uh, the project increasingly became an education in the properties of the brick unit um, and with a dry joint we were able to extend the non-load bearing pinwheel bond uh, across the corners uh, of the walls uh, so from both the elevations and this rotated view um, the pinwheel bond uh, remains uh, continuous uh, in most of these up stores um, you'll find a quote somewhere uh, this detail is typically selected by the client but in our case uh, we, we lost the brick wall uh, but we won the selection of the quote uh, a friendly reminder from our great friend stanley tigerman reads uh, the grid is abstract as well as realistic and just here are some more finished photographs If you look closely, you'll see some of these custom design return air grills um, that we uh, designed for the floor um, situated in the recessed vertical gaps between the shelving units. Uh, this is only possible because we were required to actually demolish the existing floor and replace it with steel columns and beams to support the weight of the new brick. Uh, north wall, um, here you might be reminded of a window bay um, and seeing kind of the soldier bond at the top of the vitrines uh, or the alley wall on this wall's backside. And finally, one of our favorite details, the Florida wall transition. 
here you can really kind of appreciate the nuance of each brick, including original stampings from the local foundry. So at 5,000 square feet, this next project is the largest room we've designed. Uh, the project is for the conversion of an art gallery to a sneaker come culture shop. To be more accurate, however, this is not one room, but really an enfilade made up of 10 rooms. So specific to an enfilade, the rooms are connected, but independent. No doors, only fat thresholds separate the 10 rooms and each one is designed so that the client is able to theme the space according to a specific product like clothing, footwear, apothecary, or um, event, such as reading lecture or transaction. Uh, the ex existing space is located on the first floor of a five-story factory building in Chicago's West Loop, a neighborhood once home to the city's meatpacking district. So think of it as Chicago's version of Chelsea. Uh, the building's high ceilings and exposed timber recall its industrial past. As of a few years ago, all of the district's buildings have been landmarked and are now home to a booming food, tech, and hotel industry. The more immediate history of the space is that it was previously home to one of Chicago's most prominent art galleries, owned and operated by the gallerist and collector Rona Hoffman. On the right, a previous exhibition at Hoffman's Gallery of the Iraqi American artist, Michael Rakowitz. The primary formal conceit of the project begins with a close observation of its existing structural base. The existing space, once a confection company's loading dock, consists of an eight by three heavy timber structural grid with 14 exposed one foot by one foot columns. Because the space was uh, once used as a loading dock, uh, another existing condition of note is a dramatic three foot change in elevation from sidewalk to the main interior. So this is an existing plan of the site. Um, our client had actually operated their previous store out of the northern unit at the top of your screen. The art gallery occupied the larger footprint to the south. Uh, three columns are buried in the demising wall between the two spaces and the front entry is inaccessible by wheelchair due to the aforementioned three foot grade change. Our new plan uh, aims to wedge a three by three bay plan inside of the original eight by three bay plan. This primary enfilade looks like a disfigured pinwheels spinning around a central build out space for the client to feature his rotating list of artist and designer collaborations. One thing to note are the remnants of the old plan that remain, uh, brick walls that um, once housed a vault, for example. And the result is a series of views that glimpse up to three rooms simultaneously. With regard to the three foot change in elevation between sidewalk and central space I mentioned earlier, the client and we wish to make the space handicap accessible. So in doing so, we conceived of a foyer design that would set the merchandising area of the store back by two structural bays. So upon entering the store, you would be tasked with entering the store again. To accommodate a space that would serve as entry as well as an event space, the new ground is comprised of four gentle inclines at a one to 20 slope. The four inclines are spaced so as to allow for steps uh, to mediate transitions. And what we find one of the, the rewarding distinctions between this form and others is how it sort of flickers between raked surface and extruded ground. Depending on your vantage point um, from below or above, the, the brick bond appears seamless or raised, an illusory effect first conceived through drawing. And here, a quick sequence of how you might experience the foyer upon entering the room from the street, so at first frontally, and then as you might ascend the stramp, and here, the space at night. Uh, we're going to wrap up with uh, two, two recent projects. Um, over the course of the past year and a half, um, our office has been uh, particularly busy. Um, and one of the uh, I guess areas of interest is uh, the kind of strange but familiar uh, private yet public space that is the kind of commercial office lobby. And so here you're looking at um, a, a renovation uh, that we did to the lobby at 303 East Wacker Drive. 
um, and uh, primarily the addition of a, a cafe bar called Luminary um, located uh, within, within the lobby space itself. Um, the building was originally designed in 1971 by uh, Joseph Fujikawa. If you're not from Chicago, you've probably never heard of Joseph Fujikawa, but if you dig deep into um, the, uh, the office of Mies van der Rohe, um, you'll, you'll see Fujikawa featured prominently as, as one of his uh, most important partners um, and one of three partners, including Bruno uh, Contarado and Dirk Lohan, who would uh, take over the practice uh, in 1969 uh, following Mises' death. Um, and like a lot of the projects that happened post-1969, uh, a lot of it looks like the work of, of acolytes, and, and one would argue that this is um, a very well-known um, copycat uh, building. Next slide, Carrie. Uh, the extent of alterations, see the original lobby, uh, includes a new floor, uh, a bar, a seating area, and 128 suspended point lights. Um, together, these elements draw inspiration from finishes and details from um, Miesian Tower lookalikes um, uh, or the, the Chicago office buildings that, that we know and love that are built after 1969 that don't tend to get featured in, in photographs as much. Um, here you see uh, a section of, of the existing space and um, you know, one of the major interventions of the space was uh, shrinking uh, an atrium to allow for a, a, the bar to uh, kind of float. Uh, next slide, Carrie. Uh, the bar itself is uh, simply an 18 foot by 18 foot countertop clad in piano finished walnut. So here you see the original plan on the left and our altered plan on the right. Next slide. Uh, one of the most exciting parts of the project is maybe it's most boring uh, or most normal. Um, and we drew inspiration from uh, a brass sculpture um, that actually hangs over the Four Seasons uh, bar um, at the Seagram's building. Um, it's a sculpture that um, many people know, but maybe aren't as familiar with the, the artist. Um, this is uh, the drawing uh, and plan um, of the, uh, the brass sculpture designed by Richard Lippold um, in 1958 um, that was designed for the Four Seasons. I believe the sculpture is literally titled Four Seasons, and I think that title is evident in that kind of four square organization of the, the light sculpture. Um, our budget really couldn't extend <laughs> to, to, to brass or to that level of uh, intricacy. Um, ours is a more kind of regularized uh, four square grid where we use uh, sprinkler heads to identify the, uh, the, the four squares and allow the, uh, the grid of, of point lights to be a little bit more normalized. Next slide here. Um, we were excited to design a bespoke tile grid, though, for um, the, uh, the grid itself to kind of work seamlessly with the existing um, ceiling of the, uh, the lobby. So here you see our one of the two light sculptures um, in, in, in our space and, uh, and Richard Lippold's um, exquisite uh, sculpture um, at the Seagram's Four Seasons. Next slide. And then here just a, a view of the, the, the finished space. Uh, finally, um, we'll kind of end on this project, um, or rather, Carrie will definitely have the last word, but uh, we'll end on a, a project that recently closed. Um, so this past uh, Sunday, um, uh, the uh, exhibition Chicago Comics 1960s to Now, uh, curated by Dan Nadell, uh, closed at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. This is a really exciting project for us. It was our um, first opportunity to, um, to design an exhibition in, in full. Um, we've had the, the privilege of being a part of uh, really exciting group shows like with Brendan Fernandez at the, the Whitney Biennial or um, the, the several Chicago uh, and Venice Biennales. Um, but this is our first opportunity to um, kind of work with a curator from start to finish, similar to, to, to the Arakawa and Gin's work, um, but at a much larger scale. Um, in this case, it was uh, working with a curator for over a year to organize over 300 uh, uh, works by cartoonists um, from Chicago. And uh, that included over 40 artists. And so um, we were tasked with coming up with an architectural language that was kind of flexible and um, could, uh, could allow a lot of um, movement uh, between the curator, the artists, um, and the many interests at hand. Next slide, Carrie. So the show is uh, uh, located on the fourth floor 
of the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. Um, if you've ever visited this fourth floor, it's uh, essentially four vaulted uh, gallery spaces that are oriented east-west. Um, on the east, if you were to continue on to the right of your screen, you'd hit uh, Lake Michigan, and to the west, um, you're kind of facing into the city. Um, the, the intervention was fairly, fairly straightforward and simple. Um, uh, cartoonists make very precise work that I don't think, and many cartoonists would agree, uh, doesn't sit well in a museum space, uh, largely because it's oftentimes dwarfed by the museum space. So we took it upon ourselves to, uh, to design uh, an enfilade, which is the kind of the natural progression, I think, in this uh, drawings to objects to, to rooms uh, uh, way of thinking, is we'll just make more rooms until someone lets us do a building. Um, so uh, in this case, it was the insertion of 13 partition walls, fairly tall, um, that would carve up the uh, the fourth floor galleries into these smaller galleries, sometimes like small group show galleries, um, and in other cases, monographic galleries that are dedicated to a, a single uh, artist like Carrie James Marshall or Chris Ware. Um, and then uh, the other kind of feature that allowed us to create some identity for each one of these spaces uh, was the ability to color them. Um, uh, facing east, uh, we selected a uh, vibrant color palette picked from Le Corbusier's uh, architectural polychromy um, from 1959 and uh, facing west kind of the desaturated tones of that same palette. You want to advance the next slide Carrie? Here you see that same catalog of elevation shown more conventionally on the, the left you have the western elevations and on the right uh, the eastern elevations. And in addition to color um, uh, two uh, proportions of uh, cutouts uh, were uh, enacted on the walls. Uh, one, uh, an 11 foot by 11 foot threshold that just indexed the kind of structural bay of the existing building. And then a smaller nine foot by nine foot uh, window uh, that would allow you to um, advance uh, in the show. So you could actually look to galleries that would um, uh, be kind of located further along chronologically um, and also allow you to look back to, to where you, you had been, you know, find features that we're all very familiar with when it comes to the enfilade. Uh, next slide. Uh, what was really exciting too was the, the opportunity to collaborate very closely with some of these cartoonists. Um, and so why obviously Corbusier became uh, uh, inspirational for a color palette, um, what was more inspirational was to um, transgress a bit with the Corbusier colors and collaborate with E.D. Fake on this mural, um, which, uh, which he designed um, as a black and white drawing, which we then gave uh, him colors to fill in. So the opening to the show kind of foreshadows the, the palette that you will see exploded uh, throughout the, the remaining show. And then here's some, uh, some stills. Uh, of, of the, uh, the enfilade. Um, so this is an example of looking through a threshold, through a window, through another threshold, advancing about um, 30 years in chronology. And if you go to the next slide, you'll get a glimpse of what that might've felt like. We can't take credit for the exquisite content of the show. It's a really, uh, for us kind of a game changer to the way we were introduced first to comics. I think as architects, we tend to know only Chris Ware um, and then we kind of move out from there. Uh, in this case, uh, you're kind of looking at the, uh, the work of Charles Johnson, uh, a black cartoonist who used to uh, do a lot of uh, political satirical work for uh, the Chicago Defender and now defunct uh, political magazine in Chicago. Next slide. And so if that view is looking east, now we're looking west um, at the work of Archer Pruitt. Um, and here you'll get a glimpse in the next slide of what it would like to have been in the space. And if any of you are C and Cake fans, it's a band that I was quite fond of when I was in Jason and Natalie's studio, uh, this cartoonist was the lead singer.
So in closing, uh, our work looks for value in the pre-existing. This means we invent very little and more frequently look to ways in which something that already exists can be revised, altered, adapted, and so on. We both have older siblings, and so we were introduced to hand-me-downs early on. So we realize our work may be at times read through the lens of reuse, or our rooms classified as simply interiors. Um, and, and American reuse projects still sort of tend to play second fiddle to purpose-built projects, unfortunately. Perhaps a holdover from, from modernism's privileging of the new. But for us, uh, we identify this line of work as an emerging practice. One in which, like our partnership, a project may have more than one identity. Thank you so much. Thanks. Six p.m. on the dot, Sarah. You nailed it. <clears throat> Jason, um, I think you're muted or your mic's not working. I see you're talking, but I can't. But you are unmuted. Do you wanna try taking your headphones out, Jason? I mean, if anyone has questions, we're also happy to just respond to the chat or I don't know how CCA does it. Maybe you permit people to speak. Yeah, um, generally like uh, we, we usually have like the host kind of lead the conversation, um, but it looks like Jason wants to just like ask these questions um, muted. So maybe I'll chime in and be his voice. Um, so Jason, Jason's asking, um, you know, what are most of the challenging aspects of your collaboration? Um, you know, there's quite a bit of projects, right? Being, um, you know, across the country, how does that work? Um, right, and, and of course with COVID it being the backdrop of, of a pandemic, how does that um, work with amongst uh, Norman Kelly? I'll just start off and then uh, Thomas fill in. But uh, I guess one of our advantages uh, that precipitated COVID uh, distancing and all that is that we started from afar. So we've always worked from a distance. Um, and I think early on, I think things that got lost in communication or mistranslated or something ended up kind of being productive uh, discoveries. So, you know, we would talk and then work on something and um, we might misinterpret each other. But um, we also had the benefit um, as, as uh, mentioned in, yeah. in, at the beginning that we, we've worked together for like 15 years uh, um, or uh, no more. I mean, we, we've, we've went to college together. We went uh, overlapped in grad school together. And we collaborated with um, uh, Professor Johnson and Gatenio um, on several occasions. So um, we have a long history of, of working together. But of course, um, uh, distance, uh, like anything, is a challenge. And I know um, in the past, you know, travel was something that was a little bit easier. And so I don't think I've seen you, Thomas, um, since summer of no. I think that last time I saw you was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We, we co-taught a studio together at the GSD um, in the spring of 2020. And that was, that was the last time. Yeah, I would just, I would just add that, you know, uh, in lieu of challenging, uh, one of the most exciting aspects of collaboration, I think relative to maybe the format of this uh, lecture series you have is, is, uh, 
you know, our collaboration, at least for me, is, you know, an opportunity to be someone else um, and to project, like, uh, other interests onto uh, this third uh, person um, uh, whose first name is Norman uh, and, and, and test out ideas uh, in, in a way that um, doesn't necessarily uh, sidestep uh, authorship, but uh, does, does allow and kind of permit uh, it to, to be shared. And so in addition to carry, you know, we, we work very closely with, um, with a variety of people. Uh, they're not just clients, they're um, fabricators and manufacturers or specialists um, uh, in other ways that uh, I think allow us to take on different identities for, for every project. And I know that's a little cliche, no, no two projects are the same and that you want to uh, be, be agile, but we're kind of truly committed to uh, process that is kind of driven by um, outside influence. Yeah, and perhaps we're um, burdened by only knowing architecture, because we only, we studied it in college and grad school, so it's, it's all we know. Um, so we tend to lean on uh, collaborators for pretty much almost every project. That's awesome. Um, so we have another question from an MRC student, um, Martin. Hey Martin, uh, Martin's wondering um, if the progression from drawing to object uh, to room was primarily an organizational tool for the lecture, or if it was mirror, or if it mirrors the growth and scaling of your practice. If the latter, uh, what's it been like to have developed uh, this way of working around mimicry and imitation at one scale, and bringing it with you as your project types grow, uh, as your project types grow? Where do you see the strengths and maybe limitations to that approach um, as the work scales? Great question. I mean, I think no, no practice, I think, has a clean progression. I think we do try and frame it um, and maybe an overly didactic way that privileges scale. It's the way I explain things to my daughter. Um, they start small and then they get more complex um, as, as they grow. Um, I, I think one thing that we might realize is that as you uh, maybe shift conversations from like the things that matter when you're drawing on a building uh, to the things that matter when you're actually designing um, something permanent within a building that, uh, you know, the, um, the things that seem to matter to you uh, don't necessarily matter anymore um, to someone else. I, I think uh, meaning and, uh, and importance are difficult to scale up um, in a, in a similar way. And so I think our, our interests tend to uh, expand. Um, and, you know, the hope is that uh, uh, like, like, like a comedian's uh, routine, uh, we can kind of work with one liners uh, that then shift to kind of full narratives that, um, you know, require a lot more attention and uh, a lot more time to, uh, to, to consider. And, and that's been the most exciting part about the work is that um, it does uh, it does require a lot more time to complete and a lot more time we hope to uh, to, to appreciate. That's great. I, sorry, I think my audio is working now, so I can jump in. Um, sorry about that. Um, follow up to this. My question um, sort of just bust this out a little bit and just talk about chair designers and architecture and. Um, and I read a really great um, interview that you guys did with Jeffrey Kipnis. Um, I don't remember when I read this, um, it was quite a while back, I think, but, um, and I was curious about what the limits are. I guess the question is, are chair designers good architects? Um, and what are the limits of that kind of translation between, or misreading of, um, you know, um, between one world and another? And what are the possibilities of it? Do furniture designers look at your, work your furniture work and think what what in the world is this and and uh and vice versa i'm just curious about that and then um guillermo asked a similar question um would you consider furniture creating space in a way that's necessary for architecture to exist there's a sort of interest in the kind of furniture to architecture idea i think you know historically um 
think furniture is a way for architects architects to um, test ideas, uh, whether it be uh, through through form uh, or or material. Um, but uh, it is a way to um, kind of prototype it one to one, um, and to also consider the most important factor, which is the human factor, uh, whether it's ergonomics or you know, the way. Um, uh, no, it's actually made. Um, so uh, I, I don't know if all chair, all chair designers are good architects or kind of vice versa. I don't know <laughs> if it's uh, all that important to us to consider that because um, I think it, I think it allows us to um, with with kind of every work we've done is to always try and present the work uh, as um, as one to one. Uh, the idea is that we're we're never really um, trying to produce something uh, in service of something else. Is that we Kind of take every scale very seriously, um, and 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 try to approach it through the lens of the most professional type of person uh, who would be making that drawing object or or building, and so um, yeah, we uh, kind of appreciate the different hats and the different considerations that come with those different scales. But I wouldn't necessarily say that one translates into the other and makes one better. Uh, just like a different. I mean, in addition to like the prototyping experience of the scale, um, <clears throat> sir, uh, other examples of, of furniture we've worked on is uh, tied to a setting. Um, so let's say like the Young American set um, was a way to, to rethink a, a, a context or a social narrative that was tied to a context. And so the alterations there had a sort of, uh, you know, social um, agenda in addition to, um, you know, topics that may have been really different uh, that we were interested in and in, say like the wrong chairs. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's often tied to a larger setting, the idea of a room and how uh, it, it becomes an element in which to consider a larger scale uh, or the context. I think it's another way to look at the, the you know the furniture as it might relate to the spaces we're now designing is it, it, it for us you know furniture tends to be a stand-in for like the uh, the eye uh, that kind of presents like a vantage point um, that is specific uh, just in terms of its location within a space um, and that's something that I think translate translates easily kind of across the different scales. Um, and that was exciting for us, like, for example, to do the Brendan Fernandez collaboration where, you know, it started with the design of a scale figure um, that then needed to uh, uh, inform a, a, an object. And that was a kind of a, 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 a eureka moment for us in that um, it allowed us to consider um, something that would actually precede object and drawing, um, which um, was uh, the human figure. I'm curious about, um, just to follow up on that, um, you guys are both teaching um, and collaborating through teaching also. Um, and, you know, it's really exciting to hear and to kind of follow some of the studios that you're doing together and how it, how it kind of starts to build on this and relate to this. Um, and it's, it's also super interesting to hear that you're fascinated with Agnes Martin and you said it was, um, I think you said it was beautiful, but, but boring but the work had that kind of quality to it. Um, and I'm curious how you approach teaching um, and how you approach, you know, introducing students to, you know, some of these ideas. Is it, um, is it through, like, what's the, what's the entry point to your work? Um, is it through furniture scale um, to room scale? Um, and how do you, how do you introduce, you know, the, those ideas, you know, the beautiful and the boring and, and get, get people sort of fascinated you know, with that, how do you structure it? Both Thomas and I, um, a lot of our teaching is sort of at the core level or um, kind of beginning architecture foundations uh, work or, or drawing or, 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 you know, maybe topical seminars, but, the, but primarily um, studio wise, it's been like the, the younger years, right, Thomas? Um, and so, you know, perhaps one of the ways in which like our, our, our research like infiltrates or, or gets into the, to those environments where, you know, maybe it's less uh, explicit 
might be through the use of precedent um, is, is the way I approach it. Um, so, you know, perhaps starting with the precedent and making alterations on it um, is a way for younger students to sort of exercise a, a degree of control uh, before kind of inventing. I think I, I would say maybe one of the kind of common threads that runs through the, the work we do in the practice and the way we teach is we, we, we try and um, promote, uh, I guess, slowness uh, or a, a close looking. Um, uh, and that's something that I think is fundamental to whether we're teaching core or an option studio, or I also teach now like a systems uh, a seminar um, because uh, I think so much is lost um, through uh, <laughs> reading things too quickly. And, and, and so um, repetition and uh, slowing down tend to be um, really key. Um, Cause I, you know, I do believe that uh, most of the, the work we appreciate um, whether it's furniture or um, grid drawings uh, or spaces are uh, ones that require um, a, a lengthy amount of time to appreciate it. You'll probably miss it on the first go around. And um, that's, I think, what's what's interesting to us. And, and, and that sometimes rubs certain students the wrong way because um, it, it takes too long, they're impatient. And so um, that becomes another, I think, core value of our, our courses is, is patience. Which maybe lends itself also to our kind of slow progression to, uh, conventional building. We're getting there, but we're- um, I would love it if um, other folks, Sarah, are other folks, folks able just to jump in and talk or, or, um, or are we just only fielding questions through the chat? I'm sorry if I- They can interject. So yeah. people can jump in. So folks, I'm sorry if that wasn't clear, but you can, you can turn on your mic and, and ask a question or you can just post through the chat and I'll, and I'll uh, follow up. Um, and if no one's going to jump in, I'll ask one, potentially the one last question. Give, give other folks a chance. Um, I, I have a question about um, sort of influences and, and role models. Um, and I've always been really interested to, to think I understand um, your work, but then to be constantly sort of surprised by it um in really really amazing ways and i think um over the years we've sort of seen it you know develop and i and i know that it's 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 so far beyond um chairs and and sort of the basics of how you um started out and it's so exciting to see um the new spatial work and and all the stuff you're doing and i'm really curious about um you know what you guys are up to who you're you know, who you're reading, um, who you think we should read to, to better access your work. Um, and are there, you know, folks that um, are in your life or have been in your life that you think have been influential um, and um, you might continue to look back on? Or um, are there other folks that are operating in the world that maybe you even haven't, you know, met or interacted, interacted with yet that you think would be, are, are kind of fundamental? Um, just curious about just call it the question about influences. Yeah, lately, um, I, I would say like the work of uh, the Europeans, like Lakatan Vassal and uh, <clears throat> Jan de Wilder, um, folks that are working in reuse and kind of experimental and emerging ways, or raising the uh, the bar for 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 what I think in America we call adaptive reuse and. Uh, that ha really hasn't entered the discipline of architecture. It's, uh, and so, uh, you know, we've looked look to, to offices like that. And I, I think like Lakatan Vassal's, you know, recent Pritzker win, um, you know, perhaps signals a greater shift in our, um, you know, our value. Um, but yeah, I mean, for so long, the heroes were, you know, the, the, the canon and um, we're excited by this, Kind of strain of, of uh, European architects that are kind of taking on reuse in interesting ways. Um, 
Yeah, just to kind of add on, I would kind of second Carrie's notes. I think those um, architects, I'd add like Frida Escobedo kind of into that list as well. Um, I think uh, maybe outside of architecture, we're also like heavily influenced by um, just the, the people we're lucky enough to collaborate with. Um, so, uh, you know, we're working on a, a, a distillery with a company who uh, has patented technology to convert CO2 into ethanol to make hand sanitizer and vodka. Um, that's fascinating and really interesting and that's kind of inspiring. Um, this curator we just worked with, Dan Nadell, who, um, uh, you know, kind of, I think, pulled the, uh, uh, a great reveal around um, kind of the importance of, uh, uh, you know, black cartoonists kind of within the kind of the, the culture of cartooning, um, super inspirational people who I think, uh, and I think it doesn't, you know, stop there necessarily, but, um, you know, we're, we're heavily influenced by the people we're lucky enough to collaborate with. Um, and then I think the reading lists and the things we look at and the shows we go to are then inspired by, by those conversations. And then probably like a list of architects nobody's ever heard of, um, because that sort of tasks us, it puts us on the spot to really um identify what's valuable and, and, and good about the project and so that's sort of like a worthy um yeah. challenge i'd recommend like most students because i think most of the audience here will likely be students it's it's really important to look at uh like number two architect like number two regional architects um <laughs> uh like the people that uh, aren't getting invited to do lectures and that are just kind of working it out um <laughs> Uh, it, in uh, largely second cities, and Carrie and I are big fans of those types of cities. Um, it's why you know we will never have tans uh, like Jason, because <laughs> um, uh, I think it does. It, you know, it lends itself to uh, I don't know, like a good book I'm reading right now, which is like the Open Work by Umberto Eco, to like just you know different ways of perceiving um, uh, uh, works we might be familiar with, and so. Um, not always the, the people that are getting published that are the ones you need to pay attention to. And we have this, maybe this could be the last question um, that's related to, the question is how do you approach a faculty member at your school or professional about becoming a, a kind of a mentor? And I would even sort of further that, I'm kind of curious, even to expand on that would be to, you know, maybe just talk just briefly about um, New Orleans is New Orleans a mentor to Kerry and, and is Chicago a mentor to, to Thomas? I mean, those cities seem like um, they've, they've influenced the work um, in really interesting ways. Um, and, you know, are your mentors in those environments, um, people, um, places, um, music, culture, um, just talk about your local, because you guys are hyper local, but then you're also like the model of this kind of emerging practice, which you had before COVID, you know, had this kind of, you know, kind of virtual, um, you know, sort of collaboration going. Um, but yeah, how does your local environment, you know, kind of, you know. Um, yeah, you know, I, uh, the director of UIC, Bob Somal, is, uh, you know, foremost, one of the, I think, biggest, has had one of the biggest impacts on, I think, the way we we think about architecture, not necessarily the way we um, practice or make architecture, um, but uh, you know, for me, the biggest swerve mm -hmm. was um, coming out of graduate school in 2009, meeting Bob and realizing that uh, I didn't need to know how to, and no offense to you, Jason, but I didn't need to know how to, uh, to script, code, or, um, like excel at uh, parametricism um, in order to find find a niche. Uh, um, I could I could you know listen to comedy albums and uh, go to music shows. Uh, like that was maybe one one way to you know practice. That's great. And I think we became like to some extent like <laughs> uh, a little like anti tech. For, for a bit um, or tried to resist 
uh, having not just technology, but also technique be too present in, in our work. And, and, and maybe that's also something that's starting to change. Like we're collaborating with um, this, this company called iArt um, that's based in Switzerland uh, on, on like a really techy project right now that um, hopefully when you visit it, like all the tech is really masked. Um, um, but, uh, but it's been kind of a-, a that's, so, that's so fascinating. It's, it's interesting. Uh, this will burst your bubble to the world, Thomas and, and Carrie, that you guys were like the, some of the earliest users of, of Grasshopper um, and actually scripted, you know, all of the digital fabrication components for some of our earliest well, that's, pieces, that's, like the Aurora Terry. project and other, <laughs> Terry and, you know, um, I mean, I'm just, you know, it is pretty fascinating that you, you have for sure all of that precision, but somehow you found a way to not make it, that is not the agenda precisely, you know, at the forefront. There's other, so much other um content to your work that's what which what i think makes it fascinating it's not that it's imprecise um it's just that you're bringing in you know i think a whole range of other ideas in, into the mix um so for me that's that's fascinating um, yeah i mean we're Kara, certainly like closeted or? tech jason i mean it's got to be there yeah. <laughs> you know um and it's you know we we teach tech classes too um and so, so that knowledge is there, but yeah, like you said, it's just not foregrounded, but maybe more for the students, um, I would just offer up the fact that uh, people like your faculty is probably really excited to, to help out and to, to help uh, mentor you. So I know, I mean, my personality is a little bit on the shyer side. Um, and so I remember in school, I was uh, <clears throat> maybe a little bit hesitant to reach out to more people or to um, maybe even get out of the architecture school. Um, but uh, I would say that's maybe one of the regrets is to, to, to realize that your faculty um, are, are really, they're there, they're excited to help you. Um, and, and so, you know, don't be shy. I think that's a that's a great um, that's this you know incredible to hear you guys and um, I think we'll end it there. Um, I just want to extend our, our thanks. I know um, Keith would have loved to have been here, um, and um, I want to congratulate you on the on all the new work and um, thank you guys so much for sharing not only the work but your your sort of personal perspectives on on all this um, you know kind of all these issues and and. Uh, we're all so excited to see um, where you where you're heading, and good luck, um, Carrie, with new family member coming very soon. Thomas um, too. And we uh, we're excited. We hope to host you um, in San Francisco in person. We'll get tans on both of you, whether you like it or not. Thank and, you so um, much. Yeah, it's been such thanks, an honor. Guys. Please extend and our thanks to, to Keith. All right. Cheers. Thank you, everyone.